have your attention. Do you have time together? I just wanted to introduce Vanessa. She is a Shershara Heart Program ARNP. And she's going to present to us today a little bit on the TAVR procedure. And we also have Dr. Roth and uh, so, Dr. Dr. Solomon is here too. It's been a long week. Anyway, take it away, Vanessa. Okay. Hello. I know most of you probably from Six North. I was the clinical cardiology nurse practitioner, and I just took this new role as structural heart program coordinator, which I deal with TAVR and Watchman program. So they asked me to come and just talk a little bit about the TAVR program, so I just wanted to introduce a little bit about aortic stenosis, which I'm sure you all know about. The population at risk for aortic stenosis is growing. It's estimated that 2.5 million people in the U.S. who are over the age of 75 suffer from this disease, which is about 12.4% of that population. Obviously, it's more in the elderly, which will be more than double that between now and the year 2050. To 80 million. Aortic stenosis is also my, likely to affect men more than women. 80% of adults with symptomatic aortic stenosis are male. <clears throat> Patients may live with AS for many years during a latent asymptomatic period, even before they show any of the symptoms of the disease that they develop. However, after patients begin experiencing symptoms, it's very urgent that they receive treatment. After the onset of symptoms, patients with severe AS have a survival rate as low as 50% at two years and 20% at five years without any aortic valve replacement or intervention. So what are the symptoms of aortic stenosis? Angina is obviously a sensation of aching, burning, discomfort, fullness, pain, or squeezing in the chest. It may also be felt in the arms, back, jaw, neck, shoulders, and throat. Syncope or fainting, which is a sudden and brief loss of consciousness. Dyspnea or shortness of breath, feeling winded and tired when walking or lying down. Mostly in the beginning, it's mostly with exercise and ex exertional. Um, dizziness after periods of inactivity. <clears throat> Rapid or irregular heart rhythm, palpitations, which is obviously an uncomfortable awareness of the heart beating rapidly or irregularly. TAVR, transcatheter aortic valve replacements, which is a procedure that is used to open the aortic valve via alternate Access in patients that are too high risk for the standard aortic valve replacement. It is less invasive. That does not require open heart surgery. What we still want people to consider it is heart surgery. It is valve surgery. So the three ways that you can do it is transfemoral, transapical, or transaortic. We're mostly going to be doing it transfemoral through an incision in the leg, just like people would have a cardiac catheterization or an angiogram, except they would it's going to be bilateral. Growing. So these are the types of the procedure. I also have pictures up here afterwards if you want to see what the actual valve looks like and how it is coming in through the heart. <clears throat> so that just shows you the procedure, how it would go in. Obviously it's crimped from the beginning and then it goes in and expands and then it actually deploys and it just sits right there. Prior to being seen in the valve clinic and, it's, and the patients uh, to see if they're a candidate, they're scheduled through bunch of studies, which is a TAVR CT, which is a, cat scan, a gated CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. They should have an echo within the three-month period, usually done at their primary cardiology office. We do a carotid ultrasound, ABI, PFTs, chest x-ray. We do some labs. We do a baseline pro BNP to see their status of heart failure. We do an EKG, dental clearance. We say if they need any dental procedure, it should, be, it should wait six months after, but they're also going to be on prophylactic antibiotics forever. And a cardiac cath, usually we're doing a right heart cath as well as left. Echo criteria, aortic valve area less than one centimeter. The aortic velocity is greater than four. Mean gradient greater than 40 mm. Sometimes we can do a dobutamine echo if it's needed if the EF is less than 40% with an abnormal low gradient AS. So this is just some pictures of the CAT scan, which is the evaluation that we do for TAVR. It's just some measurements that we need <coughs> over here. So that's the actual stenosis. You can see the calcifications on the leaflet. We also do a frailty evaluation, because obviously these people are older and more sick, and that's why they're coming for a TAVR and not surgical. We do a five meter walk test, a grip test, the CATS, which is a um, it's just a questionnaire about how they're performing their ADLs, how they bathe, how they clothe, how do they have to rest and sit down in between. They fill out a KCCQ questionnaire, which is mostly about heart failure. 
We do a CTS score, which is a tool used to evaluate mortality and morbidity for standard ADR and high-risk patients, and obviously just a general eyeball test and see how frail the patients look. Other evaluation, cardiac cath must be performed within the last year if the patient has had significant CAD. We recommend revascularization is performed prior to the procedure. The TAVR is usually scheduled after that. If there is a stent placed, the patient should continue Plavix pre and perioperatively. We don't stop the aspirin, we don't stop the Plavix surgery. PFTs can be performed the week prior to the procedure unless they have concerns for significant lung issues due to the carotid ultrasound, like I said. Labs chest x-ray, the CTA TAVR, which is to determine the uh, aortic annulus and the sizing suitability of the iliofemoral or alternative pathway if needed and determination of appropriate coaxial angles. Risk of the procedure, obviously a stroke. <clears throat> obviously due to the nature of the procedure, these patients are elderly and likely also have multiple comorbidities. These patients are sick. Post-procedure, we have to closely observe for stroke as you would in any surgical AVR. CVA is probably the most feared neurological complication following aortic valve surgery. The risk for CVA and TIA is greatest after the first 24 hours, which may be due to perioperative or intraop hypertension, but it usually occurs due to the embolization of calcium and debris or thrombi that form on the wires and surgical devices intraoperatively. A small valve index is associated with a greater risk of possible CVA due to the increased propensity of calcium embolization. To help prevent this, these patients are started on aspirin, initiated on post-op day one, as long as there's no contraindications such as significant post-operative bleeding, and they're also started on Plavix on post-operative day number three. So obviously a neuroassessment is very important in these patients. We're also gonna monitor hemodynamic status. We wanna keep the systolic blood pressure between 100 and 150. Labile hemodynamics are common immediate, in the immediate post-operative period of TAVR. It's usually responsive to volume resuscitation, but as you know, left ventricular hypertrophy and diastolic disease often accompany aortic stenosis. So with volume resuscitation to help maintain stable hemodynamics, these patients are obviously at risk for developing pulmonary edema and pulmonary effusions post-operatively. Monitor signs of cardiac tamponade which are muffled heart sounds, increased JVD, hypotension, <coughs> chest pain radiating to the neck, check and, uh, chest and back, dizziness, and chest discomfort that improves with sitting or leaning forward. Patients will also have an echo on post-op day one as standard, but can be ordered stat at bedside if it's needed. Monitor telemetry and be vigilant for any arrhythmia or AV nodal heart disease, including incomplete heart block. Some patients will be coming out with an external pacemaker if needed. There will be a higher risk if they have any pre-existing bundle branch block or a large arterial size. Peripheral vascular assessment is warranted given the large catheters used into the groins. Also at risk for retroperitoneal bleed, look for symptoms including supra-inguinal tenderness, severe back pain, and femoral neuropathy along with unstable hemodynamics. And obviously monitor the groin sites for bleeding, increased swelling, and signs and symptoms of a hematoma. So the TAVR procedure we meet as a TAVR committee bi-weekly to go over the potential candidates. Right now we're doing TAVR procedures every other Friday. Currently we're going to perform two a day. Patients are usually the same day admissions, but obviously they can be hospitalized prior and they would have to have surgery as an inpatient. Patients will be transferred directly to the CVRU postoperatively. Most of the lines are out and the patients will be extubated. There may be times when the patient will come out of the drips for pressure support or control. Patients should be able to sit up four hours afterwards unless there are groin issues such as post-operative bleeding. Patients should be out of bed early the next morning. Usually will be transferred to 6 North post-op day one if stable. Families will be asked to wait in the cath lab waiting room during the procedure. So this is the stuff that I just went over before about the neurological status and increased risk for CVA, the blood pressure tamponade, the arrhythmia, paravascular and the retroperitoneal bleed. Patients will have one week follow-up with their primary cardiologist and a two week follow-up with their, with their PCP. These patients are also, we belong to this big registry, which requires a 30 day and one year follow-up with the structural heart clinic. On those visits, patients will be seen by the surgeon or with me and I'll have an echo and EKG labs and also fill out that KCCQ will all be performed. I have a little video, hopefully it will work. It's just very quick. It's, it's, it's very quick, it's just a quick
quick illustration so you can visualize how it goes in from the groin. That's the capita. So that it's quivering, that's when they're doing fast pacing. So the difference is a lot of people have been asking what's the difference. Obviously, aortic valve replacement surgeries, you're replacing the valve here. You're actually just kind of pushing it forward. We're not doing anything to the old valve. We're just sticking the new one in and kind of pushing the other leaflets up. I've mentioned not not all of them will come out right with a temporary case or not all. Everybody gets a temporary pacemaker during the case. If there's no reason for them to keep it, they will lose it. We'll, we'll take it out during the case. If they have any kind of bundle branch block, either before or postoperatively, right or left, or any kind of arrhythmias that are worrisome, we'll keep the pacemaker in. We can see it at the bedside. It will be uh, right ventricle uh, pacing only. It'll be RBV pacing only. Yes. 